This week, 2024 campaign trail was on the road with Vice President Harris, as she was in Florida delivering remarks on women's health care as a six-week abortion ban went into effect in the Sunshine State. And from Michigan, former President Donald Trump at one of two Midwest rallies he held on Wednesday. Also, highlights from a press conference with the Poor People's Campaign, plus an in-depth look at the U.S. Senate race in Arizona this year. But first, the latest swing state polls in the presidential race. Emerson College and The Hill newspaper looked at the presumptive Democratic and Republican presidential nominees' support in seven key swing states that are likely to decide this year's election. In all of them, Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, former President Trump held a slight advantage. But only one of those leads, in Arizona, was outside the poll's three-point margin of error. In an effort to boost the campaign's standing, President Biden and Vice President Harris were yet again on the road hitting on their message of women's rights. The vice president was in Jacksonville, Florida, and CNN. Reporters DJ Judd and MJ Lee noted that her speech included at least 18 direct mentions of former President Trump, the most of any remarks she's made this cycle. Next, some of that event in Jacksonville. Across our nation, we witness a full-on assault, state by state, on reproductive freedom. And understand who is to blame. Former President Donald Trump did this. <laughs> Donald Trump handpicked three members of the United States Supreme Court because he intended for them to overturn Roe. And as he intended, they did. Now, many of you here may recall, I served on the Judiciary Committee as a United States Senator. And I questioned two of those nominees. To one of them I asked, quote, I will quote myself, <laughs> can you think of any laws that give the government the power to make decisions about the male body? And it will come as no shock to everyone here, he had no good answer. And that day, we all knew what was about to come. And it happened, just as Donald Trump intended. Now, present day, because of Donald Trump, more than 20 states have abortion bans. More than 20 Trump abortion bans. And today, this very day, at the stroke of midnight, another Trump abortion ban went into effect here in Florida. As of this morning, four million women in this state woke up with fewer reproductive freedoms than they had last night. This is the new reality under a Trump abortion ban. Starting this morning, medical professionals like Dr. Tien could be sent to prison for up to five years for providing reproductive care, even earlier in pregnancy. Reality under a Trump abortion ban. Starting this morning, women in Florida became subject to an abortion ban so extreme it applies before many women even know they are pregnant. Which, by the way, tells us the extremists who wrote this ban either don't know how a woman's body works, or they simply don't care. Trump says he wants to leave abortion up to the states, he says, up to the states. All right. So here's how that works out. Today, one in three women of reproductive age live in a state with a Trump abortion ban, many with no exception for rape or incest. This truly is a health care crisis, and Donald Trump is the architect. And by the way, that is not a fact he hides. In fact, he brags about it. He has said the collection of abortion bans in the state is, quote, 
working the way it's supposed to. Just this week in an interview, he said, states have the right to monitor pregnant women to enforce these bans. And states have the right to punish pregnant women for seeking out abortion care. So Florida, the contrast in this election could not be more clear. Basically, under Donald Trump, it would be fair game for women to be monitored and punished by the government, whereas Joe Biden and I have a different view. We believe the government should never come between a woman and her doctor. So here's what a second Trump term looks like. More bans, more suffering, less freedom. But we are not going to let that happen. Because, you see, we trust women. We trust women to know what is in their own best interest. And this November, up and down the ballot, reproductive freedom is on the ballot. And you, the leaders, you, the people, have the power to protect it with your vote. Donald Trump may think he can take Florida for granted, it is your power that will send Joe Biden and me back to the White House. Following Vice President Harris's remarks in Florida, the campaign put out this ad. Like Donald Trump's new comments on abortion, saying that some states might choose to monitor women's pregnancies to possibly prosecute women who violate abortion bans. Two years ago, I became pregnant with a baby I desperately wanted. And I learned that the fetus would have a fatal condition and never survive. Because of the new laws in Texas, I had to flee my own state to receive treatment. If Donald Trump is elected, that is the end of a woman's right to choose. There will be no place to turn. We could lose our rights in every state, even the ones where abortion is currently legal. And that means every woman in every state is at risk. Donald Trump took away our freedom. We need leaders that will protect our rights and not take them away. And that's Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Former President Donald Trump, the presumptive Republican presidential nominee, was also on the trail the same day as Vice President Harris, as it was one of the days he didn't have to attend his New York City criminal trial centered on hush money payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels. The former president held two rallies on Wednesday, one in Wisconsin and one in Michigan, both battleground states he won in 2016 but lost in 2020. Next, some of the rally in Freeland, Michigan, with comments from the former president on the criminal trial and abortion policy. Joe Biden is the worst, most incompetent, most corrupt president in the history of our country. And Crooked Joe knows that in a fair election, He's going down in a landslide. Every poll is showing that. You've seen the polls. That's why Biden is trying so hard to jail. He wants to jail his political opponent like they do in third world countries or banana or banana republics. He wants to give it a shot. There's only one problem. Every one of these fake cases is bullshit. Every single one of them. Terrible. And as you know, I've come here today. <laughs> Thank you. As you know, I have come here today from New York City, where I'm being forced to sit for days on end in a kangaroo courtroom with a corrupt and conflicted judge enduring a Biden sideshow trial at the hands of a Marxist district attorney, Soros Back, who's taking orders from the Biden administration. They're all, all of these trials. By the way, so if I didn't run or if I came in fourth, I'd have no problem right now. I'd be in a beautiful someplace 
I'd be someplace. But you know what? Honestly, look at this crowd. I'd rather be with you. I would much rather. I'd much rather be with you. Much rather. I'd much rather be with you. But what you're witnessing in New York is not a legal proceeding. It's an unlawful exercise in very stupid and very evil politics. But here's the good news. It's driven the poll numbers higher than we've ever had before. Because people get it. It's a scam. And they get it. These indictments are not just an attack on me. They're an assault on the constitutional rights of all Americans. They did this because it's an attack on a political opponent. And a lot of political opponents wouldn't do too well under those circumstances. But I have a relationship with the people, and I explain it to them, and they understand it's a scam, and they understand it's the worst president in the history of our country by far who couldn't get elected dog catcher, except that he's in a party that's really, really good at cheating. That's one thing. They're not good at policy. They're horrible. Open borders, high interest rates, high taxes, bad military. Everything's bad. No home. Everything's bad. But they're great at cheating in elections. It's about the only thing they do well. In the middle of a presidential election, think of it, the Republican nominee for president is being attacked like nobody's ever been attacked before. But all of that being done and all of that being said, the fake charges, the legal targets, everything. And, you know, we've had tremendous reviews from great people, Jonathan Turley, Andy McCarthy, Mark Levin, Greg Jarrett, Sean Hannity. And the judge, by the way, is the most conflicted person in the history. I don't think there's ever been a more conflicted judge. Crooked and conflicted. And I'm unconstitutionally gagged. He gagged me. So I'm not even supposed to be, I would say, talking to you because he gagged me. I'm the, I'm, think of it, former president and a very popular president. We had the greatest economy in history. We had, the, we had the best, safest border that we ever had in history. And by the way, while we're on it, it was always the plan from the great legal experts of this country and even the world, everybody, Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, they wanted to get abortion out of the federal government. You know that. After 50 years, we were able to do that, and now you're seeing it done. Some people will be happy. Some people will be okay. Some people won't be quite as happy. Some will be thrilled. Some of the decisions there are really, they vary quite a bit. And remember this, as a politician, you have to have heart. You have to have what your heart determines, and you have to fight for what's in your heart and what's the right thing to do. But remember, you also have to get elected. Getting elected is also important, not only on this issue, but on taxes and military and everything else. You have to get elected, because if you don't get elected, it goes back to the federal government, perhaps, or you have many other things that can go wrong. So go with your heart, do what's right, we did something that took courage. We did something that everybody wanted to see. But now I say it's up to the states. And I want to thank the Supreme Court justices for having the courage. Uh, Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, John Roberts, Brett Kavanaugh, Neil Gorsuch, Amy Coney Barrett, for the wisdom and the courage to do this. This took a great deal of courage and a great deal of wisdom to do this. And all we want to do is we have to get our country back together. It takes a very long forward over issue, an issue that was never going to be resolved, according to many. It brings it back to the states where every legal scholar and where most people wanted to see it, and it's working out. So I just want to thank the Supreme Court for the wisdom and for the courage, and thank you very much. One last bit of news from the presidential race. Independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s campaign said he had secured ballot access in California, the nation's most populous state. That makes four states total where he's already on the ballot, including Utah, Hawaii, and Michigan, and another six where he's met the signature threshold but not yet been certified. His campaign also called on President Biden to get out of the race, calling the incumbent a spoiler. 
Next, a video the campaign released on the internal polling that led Mr. Kennedy to label President Biden a spoiler. Hello, everyone. My name is Jonathan Hiller, and I'm the director of content at Team Kennedy. And today we're going to be talking about numbers. Nerd alert! All right, by now you probably know that Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is running as an independent candidate for president of the United States. But you probably have heard him spoken about like this. A spoiler candidate, a spoiler. Spoiler called Kennedy a spoiler. I'm a spoiler. But is this really true? I mean, is Bobby really a spoiler in this election? We looked into it, and now we have the answers. Now, the preface here is that most polls are conducted by mainstream media outlets, and typically they have 1,000 to 3,000 or so respondents per poll. And most of those polls have about a plus or minus 3% margin of error. Well, we conducted a nationwide poll of over 25,000 respondents and our margin of error was 0.6%. That makes it by far the most accurate predictor of the 2024 election that we have thus far. All right, let's dive into the maps. This is the head-to-head -head matchup between Biden and Trump. Trump with 294 and Biden with 244. Trump wins by 50 electoral votes. And if you're a political nerd like myself, you know that that is not very close. And with Bobby as a third party candidate, Biden only picks up two additional states, so he still loses to Trump. All right, now here is where it gets very interesting. In a head-to-head -head matchup, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. wins 367 electoral votes versus Joe Biden's 171. Now that is what we call a landslide. And what's even crazier about these numbers is when you look at the ad spend of these two campaigns, Biden has spent over $36 million in advertising since October 1st, and we have spent a little over two. Now, the next head-to-head -head matchup that we pulled was Bobby versus Trump. Obviously, this is a very close election, but Bobby still wins. All right, so to recap, Biden cannot beat Trump in a head-to-head -head race, and it is not close. Biden cannot beat Trump in a three-way race, and it's still not very close. Bobby wins in a landslide against Biden head-to-head, -head, and Bobby beats Trump head-to-head. -head. So wait, who is actually the spoiler here? Because a spoiler is a non-winning candidate whose presence on the ballot affects which candidate wins. A non-winning candidate affecting a possible winning candidate. So if you do not want to see Donald Trump become the next president of the United States, there is only one candidate running who has the power to beat him, and it is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. From the nation's capital, C-SPAN also covered a press conference held this past week by the Poor People's Campaign, which announced a mass march on Washington this summer. Poor and low-wage voters are saying this season that we, our votes are demands and not merely support for candidates. And what we're doing is mobilizing those votes and saying to candidates, if you want these votes, then talk to poor and low wage folk. The number one reason poor and low wage folk do not vote according to the study is waking the sleeping giant is nobody talks to them. We have debate after debate for Senate, for president, and the issues that affect poor and low wage persons uh, do not come up. We had in, 19, uh, in 2020 a bill come up to pass a living wage of $15 an hour in the union, which would have lifted 52 million poor and low-wage Americans out of poverty and low wage. 43 percent of African Americans alone, most of the persons would have been white and women. And eight Democrats and 49 Republicans said no to 52 million Americans that 70% of Americans want a raise in living wage because we haven't raised the minimum wage since 2009. Poor and low-wage folk and moral and religious leaders are saying no more. We must mobilize this power. And we want the media to be clear that when we talk about poverty, we're talking about in all of its areas, race, gender, uh, uh, um, geography. A third of all poor people live in the South. A third of all poor white people live in the South. Uh, nearly 60% of black people are poor and low wage, but the majority of people who are poor and low wage are white, over 40, 40 million more than the number of black folk in raw numbers. The largest demographic of poverty is among women, primarily white women. And our children now are 51% of all children are poor and low wage. These are serious matters, and we have serious power. 
So this is an offensive move. We're calling on people to come by the thousands, by the thousands, to join with us. This is a time for a mass mobilization of consciousness, to call people to to, to, to vote. We don't just need a political vote this year, we need a movement vote that's not based on party but based on principle, based on where people stand on critical issues. So we're calling on folks that this is a nonviolent. Uh, we are the resurrection, not an insurrection. That's why we're coming. And we're not, we're saying the last picture of what uh, of DC ought not be people tearing the Capitol up and trying to tear democracy down. We need a picture of folk trying to build a democracy up and lift up all people, regardless of who they are, regardless of who they are. So that's why we're coming. Ronald Hansen is national political reporter with the Arizona Republic, here to talk about the US Senate race in that state. Ronald Hanson, when Kirsten Sinema said she would not seek another term, what was the impact of that on this Senate race? You know, it really did have a significant impact. There's been sort of some mystery around this race since she switched to an independent in late 2022. It really made it difficult, I think, to get a fix on what the shape of this race really was. She was an incumbent senator who used to raise a lot of money. It, there was no indication that she was going to jump into the race, but she never really pulled out of it either. So I think from a polling perspective only, it really sort of made it uh, difficult to get a read on what dynamics people were even going to face. That has cleared up in the past month, though there have been other newsworthy items that have sort of reshaped the race as well. Right. Before we get to those, who's running? Right now, we have uh, U.S. Representative Ruben Gallego. He is the only prominent Democrat running in this race. You, we have two notable Republicans running in a primary um, that is uh, former gubernatorial candidate Carrie Lake. She is a former TV broadcaster here locally and ran and lost the 2022 governor's race in Arizona. We also have Pinal County Sheriff Mark Lamb. He is uh, from a county that sits roughly between Phoenix and Tucson. What is the primary race like between those two? And what are the polls showing? Carrie Lake is really sort of the presumed favorite, uh, the almost presumptive nominee in waiting. There's been no significant polling uh, that has been public facing that suggests anything to the contrary. The National Republican Senatorial Committee has notably already endorsed Carrie Lake and thrown in with her. Uh, they are raising money with her. They have put an ad out on behalf of her effort in a sense by going after Ruben Gallego. Uh, there is no indication that the NRSC is anything other than fully behind Kerry Lake, who also, it should be mentioned, has the endorsement of former President Donald Trump as well. So this is a primary race really in name only in many respects. There is a possibility they will have a debate at the end of June, and that could help tip this race. I think the real question is, much like we saw in a lot of Republican presidential primaries, is how strongly will Lake do given she's running against somebody who's really struggled to raise money and has nowhere near the visibility that she does? What are her strengths and her weaknesses in this race? For Carrie Lake, I think the strength is that in a Republican primary, she is far and away uh, very popular with Republican voters. She is very closely identified with former President Trump. She is someone who is um, sort of that America first MAGA style politician writ large. The problem in a general election is all of those same things are still true in a state that is drifting to the political middle and where she figures to not have uh, as many financial resources, perhaps, as Congressman Gallego. And she has a record that is... Uh, that has already failed with voters once and could be problematic moving ahead into November. And Congressman Gallego's strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, I think his strength is, number one, he doesn't have a primary really to get through. He also has uh, a pretty good fundraising track record. And since Senator Sinema's departure from this race, 
he has also picked up the endorsement of Senator Sinema's seatmate, Senator Mark Kelly, who is among the most prolific fundraisers in the country and has really already put Kerry Lake on his radar screen. He uh, has made that a priority of his to help defeat Kerry Lake. So for Ruben Gallego, there's no primary to get through. He has a lot of financial resources and a lot of national Democrats want to see him do well. Uh, his biggest challenge, I think, in this race at this point is he's not especially well known throughout the state. He's known in the Phoenix area, but more broadly, he's still relatively undeveloped. And that becomes a question of who's going to define Ruben Gallego. For the moment, he has the resources to help send out that message. The NRSC and in a secondary way, Kerry Lake, they are trying to define him. Uh, they have made note of his divorce from Phoenix Mayor Kate Gallego. There was uh, that happened just before uh, Mayor Gallego gave birth to their first and only child. So this is sort of a personal line of attack that will stand in contrast, I'm sure, to what we're going to hear a lot about abortion rights from Congressman Gallego as it relates to uh, Carrie Lake. Right. What are the issues? What are the 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 policy issues that are driving this Senate race? We had an Arizona Supreme Court ruling that essentially upheld the 1864 abortion ban that abor bans abortions in nearly all cases except for the life of the mother. This is suddenly really placed itself at the fore of a lot of concerns. It could bring in uh, a new swath of voters who might have been uh, only marginally engaged. It is something that has added uh, new resources, new energy, new money. It's the kind of thing that feels like it is uh, a significant event that uh, Republicans don't feel is going to run to their benefit. So that is something that the Democrats certainly want to keep front and center. On the other side, Republicans have really had a pretty uh, uh, effective line of attack as it relates to border and security issues. Uh, this state's um, numbers from Mexican immigrants and others has been through the roof really since the uh, dawn of the Biden administration. And the Phoenix area in particular has been among the hardest hit as it relates to inflation. So that whole inflation and public safety sort of arguments have been pretty effective here, both for former President Trump and for Kerry Lake, in terms of really trying to keep the heat on Democrats to make the case that they deserve to keep power. Um, but again, the injection of the abortion issue, along with just a sense that uh, perhaps Kerry Lake is just a bridge too far uh, I think that's where you're going to see the contours of this race. Would you say the fate of these two candidates are tied to the presidential candidates or could there be a split ticket scenario? I think there's definitely the possibility of a split ticket, but it's a relatively low one. The idea that Ruben Gallego could outrun President Biden, I think, is uh, is possible depending on how issues play themselves out heading into the fall uh, I've not seen any polling um, that suggests that Kerry Lake can outrun Donald Trump. So I think that um, if it's a good night for President Trump, you would expect that Kerry Lake might have enough support to pull across the finish line. Uh, if it's a good night for President Biden, uh, there's almost no chance that Kerry Lake can outrun uh, Donald Trump at this point. What about rumors that Carrie Lake is on the former president's shortlist as a vice presidential candidate? If she were to be picked, what then happens? Yeah, that would certainly throw Arizona's Senate race into uh, a good deal of tumult. Uh, they do have a Republican candidate in the wings in Pinal County Sheriff Mark Lamb. So there would be a nominee that they could turn to if it happened ahead of the primary. Uh, if it resulted in a sort of more extraordinary circumstances where uh, they had to go back and, and find somebody and renominate them through sort of party means, intra-party means, uh, again, they have a candidate off the shelf who has been engaged in this race. But I think realistically, uh, former President Trump has had the opportunity to 
show that kind of support for Carrie Lake. And he has said explicitly that he uh, thinks she's going to make a great senator. It was really interpreted as sort of the um, sort of final lock that that's where you're going. You're going to be in the Senate race. She has been a prominent surrogate, especially in Iowa for uh, the Trump campaign. Um, but there's been not a lot of chatter about her uh, being a serious contender at this point, though where the Trump uh, candidacy is involved, certainly surprise is part of the, uh, the, the, the events that we've seen many times over the years. Ronald Hansen, national political reporter with the Arizona Republic. Thank you for your time. Thank you. A reminder, this program and all of C-SPAN's campaign 2024 coverage can be found online at cspan.org slash campaign.